Good evening. Can you hear me? No? It says on. Is this better? Okay, great. I'm Ellen Levy, Chair of the Great Decisions Committee and a board member with the World Affairs Council of Western Michigan. I want to welcome you to, this is I believe the seventh in our series. This also looks like our largest crowd this season. We knew there was going to be a lot of interest in tonight's topic. How many council members do we have with us tonight? Great. And students taking class for credit or not credit? Welcome. If you're not already a council member, please sign up in the lobby for an email reminder of our, our events. There's no obligation, and you'll keep up with over 30 events a year, but we hope you'll join. And our Great Decisions Guide is still available in the lobby for a mere $20. Um, as every week you have a ballot in your program, please fill it out and put it in one of the marked boxes in the lobby. Your opinion joins thousands of others and is sent to the White House and the Secretary of State. I'd like to thank our evening sponsor, Priceline.com Incorporated. We have a group from Priceline over here. Let's give them a warm hand. Is William Shatner here? Oh, you couldn't get him, okay. Um, and also thank you to our media sponsor, Michigan Radio. Before we do get into the very serious topic for this evening, I feel I must make mention of Captain Van Hook's last name. Captain Van Hook, we think your last name is really Cap is Hook, in that you added it for our population here in, in West Michigan. And he, he's wearing a great tie. If you get a chance to come up and ask him a question, it says, don't give up the ship. We are webcasting this evening to Ferris State University and two of their locations, Big Rapids and, and Traverse City. Several students taking the class are from the Great Lakes Maritime Academy. So a shout out to Ferris State students tonight. Welcome, Ferris. While our topic this evening is rather catchy, Pirates on the High Seas, it is, of course, a deadly serious topic. There was an attempt several weeks ago to re-hijack the Maersk, Alabama. We, of course, expect to get more information on that from Captain Van Hook. Recently, four Americans were hijacked from their boat and killed off the coast of Somalia. Conventional wisdom in the shipping industry had been that Somali pirates are businessmen looking for a multi-million dollar ransom payday, not insurgents looking to terrorize people. Is this the game changer? Captain Van Hook addresses this serious topic from a unique vantage point. He is a former Navy squadron leader in the Gulf of Aden off Somalia and is now a maritime industry executive. His complete bio, of course, is in your program. Captain Van Hook, we look forward to your talk tonight. Okay, uh, thank you, Ellen. Uh, I hope everybody can hear me okay. Okay, great. Uh, I'm very pleased to be here tonight. Very happy. Uh, I was happy to get the invitation to come to Western Michigan. I'm always happy to get out of Washington, uh, but it was particularly nice to come to an, a part of the country that I'd never been to. And uh, so uh, thank you very much for having me. Uh, I think I'm falling apart here already. Uh, this is a uh, topic that uh, is of great interest, uh, as Ellen said, to, uh, to my company and to our in industry. Uh, it's a complex problem, uh, has a lot of, well, we're going to get re rewired here, sorry, my big ears are... Not big uh, enough. Yeah, not big enough, maybe. Okay. Okay, I'll try not to move my head too much, or kind of a fused uh, angle here. Uh, so uh, let's just, uh, we'll get into it. These are my uh, typical disclaimers. Uh, these are my personal views. I'm not really representing my company or the maritime industry. Uh, my views are colored. As Alan said, I'm, I'm a former naval officer, 29 years of experience as a naval officer and three years of experience with Maersk. And so I've, I've learned a lot about the commercial maritime industry in these three years. and. Uh, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's a part of the world, a part of business that, that I didn't really know about too much. I used to, when I was a naval officer, I'd watch these big ships go by and I'd say, gee, I wonder if anybody's awake over there. And uh, now I find out they're, they're looking back at the, at the warships saying, I wonder what the heck they're going to do. 
because uh, sometimes warships look kind of unpredictable to commercial ships, which are on their set patterns and, uh, and lines. Uh, so uh, these are my views, not the, the views of, of, of Maersk. There are some differences uh, within the industry. It's a very diverse industry, and there's differences even within our company about how to deal with some of these issues. Uh, we also have this gentleman on the right here is uh, suing us. He's one of our crew members from Maersk, Alabama. So we do have ongoing litigation going on. So I'll, I won't really get into a lot of the very, very specific details of Maersk, Alabama and some of the things uh, that happened. Uh, we also have ongoing criminal proceedings against uh, the pirates involved. Uh, this gentleman to the left here was the, the only guy that survived out of the Maersk, Alabama uh, incident, and he was tried recently and found guilty and uh, I think sentenced to 36 years. And of course, he's got an appeal working. So again, I have to be careful about that. And then uh, the picture of the Capitol there, it's an ongoing political issue between uh, the executive branch and the legislative branch. And there's, there's some proposed legislation there. So I, I, I always tread kind of softly on, on areas that uh, are of interest to, to my company and, and uh, the industry uh, writ large. Uh, also, there's the issue of operational security. I, I don't get into specific measures that uh, we employ uh, on our on particular ships because it's an issue of, of making sure the bad guys don't know that as well. Uh, this is one of my favorite slides, though. If you uh, if you look at this young China Chinese uh, crewman out here, he's got a line of Molotov cocktails lined up. That this is his own counter piracy measures that he's taken on. And it kind of highlights to you what these poor mariners have to deal with. They're out there by themselves. They're out on the big blue ocean, and uh, it's up to them to come up with the resources to, to deal with uh, some of these bad guys that are out there. It is still the great unknown out there, and there are some unsavory characters, uh, uh, definitely in this part of the world. Now, you can see he has fortified himself with a, a can of Sintal beer. And there are a number of empties on the deck here rolling around. So he's, uh, he's ready to go. Uh, I can tell you that we have not endorsed this particular practice and uh, way of, of dealing with pirates. Uh, just to give you a little background on, on my company and the greater AP Moeller Maersk group, uh, it, it, it's probably the poster child for globalization. It's a giant. Uh, uh, group that spans everything from energy to uh, uh, bulk to container uh, uh, transit and uh, uh, both ashore and at sea. Over 1,300 ships, uh, everything ranging from supply vessels to oil tankers, uh, LNG carriers, and definitely the world's largest container fleet with over 550 just container vessels uh, out there. We have offices all over the world. Just in Africa, we have 65 different offices. Uh, everything, Maersk, Kenya, Maersk, Senegal, Maersk, Nigeria. We operate terminals. We operate five major terminals in Africa and all throughout Europe, Asia, South America, North America. Uh, if you want to move something, our company's probably going to touch it at some, some point. Uh, 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 as an example, uh, when, when the United States was looking for alternate ways to get into Afghanistan, vice the, the route through Pakistan, which was proving very dangerous, they came to us. We did, devised a whole northern distribution network going in through Riga and uh, all the way down through. We actually own parts of the Trans-Siberian Railroad. So uh, uh, it's really uh, an amazingly large, versatile group. Now, my company is Maersk Line Limited, which is uh, limited in that it's a, a smaller subsection. It's an American company that operates the U.S. flag portion of the AP Molar Maris Group. And we're a little bit unique in that we, uh, we operate uh, a whole mix of ships. We operate, uh, whereas the other parts of the AP Molar Group have separate companies that run just tankers, just LNG, just container ships. We have uh, 24 container ships. We have four row row ships. And we also have a, a side of our business where we actually uh, manage and operate ships for the United States Navy uh, and the pre-positioning force. So there's two big ammunition ships there that we 
we operate uh, uh, for pre-positioning. Uh, seven special mission ships that, uh, if you, some of you may have studied or remember uh, the Impeccable, which was a special mission, a U.S. Navy ship that got in trouble off China, that got harassed by the Chinese and Chinese fishing boats. That was actually one of our ships, so there were people in marish blue coveralls uh, 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 manning that ship. We also manage uh, Army watercraft for them. Uh, as a U.S. flag carrier, we are the largest U.S. flag carrier, and we do have global operations, which is unusual for, for U.S. flag uh, ships. Uh, uh, but that also puts us in a lot of parts of the world, areas that are a little bit hairy, and I'm going to talk to you about some of those areas tonight. So uh, when we talk about the uh, about 21st century piracy, uh, it's, uh, piracy uh, as a phenomenon isn't that unusual. It's been around forever, really. People are, are amazed that, that piracy is still going on in this day and time, uh, but it's been going on since ancient times. It just has risen to the level now that it's gotten on everybody's radar. People are seeing it on the evening news, but it, it's not a new phenomenon. It's, uh, uh, there is a difference between what we call maritime crime, which is normally within the territorial waters of, of a country, and piracy, which is classically on the high seas in the international waters. Uh, some of the hot spots that uh, we've seen lately have been uh, Gulf of Guinea is, is a bad area, uh, Straits of Malacca, uh, some of the waters of Southeast Asia. There's some areas off South America that are, that are bad. But definitely uh, the most of uh, the recent uh, attacks have been off the Horn of Africa and Somalia. And that accounts for about two thirds of uh, the cases uh, uh, this year. Uh, I'll go over some of the events that led up to uh, Marisk, Alabama. As I said, I'm gonna use Mar Marisk, Alabama as, as a case study. Uh, in 2008, Late 2008, we started to get concerned about the situation out there, increasing uh, attacks, uh, and we were operating a small, uh, very similar ship to the Marisk, Alabama, Marisk, Arizona, was operating uh, from the port of Salala, oh, oh, the port of Salala up here in Oman, and she was working between Oman and Djibouti, and she was carrying largely food aid for the Department of State. And uh, so you can, you can imagine that uh, is a very high risk area <laughs> right in here. This is the Gulf of Aden leading up to the Red Sea and the Suez Canal. Most traffic is moving this way through here. And this is where the, the attacks were really starting to spike up in uh, late 2008, early 2009. So we discontinued the use of uh, Marish, Arizona in that, on that run. And that's what's called a feeder run. I'll go over that a little bit later. But, uh, we decided to take her off that run and use our bigger ships, our bigger G-class ships, which are 65,000 tons, very large. Uh, they carry 4,400 containers. They run at about 25 knots, and, and they, they have a very high freeboard. So we felt a lot safer by just having them go through, pick up uh, containers in Djibouti and drop them off in Salala, and then move on to the rest of their run. Uh, we got more and more concerned as we talked to people in government, as we talked to the Navy. I, I remember talking to one admiral and, and uh, uh, saying, well, I'm not sure that everybody's aware of the U.S. flag ships that are operating out there. And he, and he said, U.S. flag? What U.S. flag? Because some of you may know the U.S. flag industry, the American shipping, commercial shipping, has been in a state of decline for many years. Uh, there's a lot of complex reasons for that. Uh, uh, ships are, uh, our ships are highly regulated uh, by the Coast Guard. It's not a bad thing. I mean, they're kept in very good condition and everything, but that, that comes at a cost. And uh, we also use unions to operate our ships, and that, that's just more expensive. So the U.S. flag commercial maritime industry has been in decline for a number of years and really would not exist if it was not for U.S. flag impelled cargo which requires a U.S. flag to carry it. So if it's U.S. government cargo, it has to have a U.S. flag ship uh, to operate it. So part of our uh, model uh, with uh, Marish Line Limited is to operate U.S. flag ships on a liner service. They're operating 
basically like a bus schedule going from port to port to port, and you know exactly what day and what time they're going to be there, but they have a U.S. flag on them, and they'll carry any U.S. government cargo that has to go between these ports internationally, but uh, we'll have about a third of our space that will be empty that we then charter uh, to our parent company and carry other goods uh, in that. So uh, we became concerned about the lack of understanding. We held a, a tabletop exercise the month before the Marist Alabama happened. Uh, and a tabletop, I mean, we got everybody together. We got all the interagency players together, Coast Guard, Maritime Administration, uh, Mar Military Sea Lift Command, uh, FBI, uh, all together in the same room and started talking about what are we going to do if this happens. And that got us a little bit more concerned so that I personally made a trip out to the Middle East in, uh, in April of 2009 uh, to go out to Bahrain uh, and talk to some of my old uh, naval buddies out there about what are we going to do if, if something bad happens to a U.S. flagship. And that's one way my company is a little bit unique. They've actually invested in a person like me that has naval contacts. I knew half the people out there still, uh, so I could go out there and talk to them about, uh, about this at a very serious level. I, I also, st because of the nature of our company, and we work so closely with the Navy, I still have a uh, top secret security clearance, so I could go and talk to them at, at whatever level they wanted to talk about. So. Uh, this is Maersk, Georgia. It's one of those big ships I talked to you about, the, the bigger uh, Panamax-sized ships. Uh, after I was done talking to the folks out in Fifth Fleet, to the staff out there, I decided to ride one of our ships uh, to see how they uh, dealt with counter-piracy measures out there. And I went to Salala, as I mentioned to you before, Salala, Oman. And I had two ships to choose from. One was uh, Maersk, Georgia, uh, which is the same type of ship you see here and uh, Marist Alabama, which is uh, this type of ship here. And you can see the difference. Uh, Alabama is a much uh, lower uh, ship, a smaller ship. It's only about 1,100 containers. And she operates from Salala in Oman down to Mombasa, Kenya. So she, at that time, was operating as our East African feeder vessel, uh, uh, which it's very dangerous now, it's a very dangerous area, but at that time in 2009, it w there were not nearly as many attacks out in the Somali Basin as, as there have been here recently. So I was able to choose from between the two, and I wanted to ride the, the Maersk, uh, Georgia, which was on her way to go through the Gulf of Aden, which was a lot hotter at that time, had more action, I thought I'd be able to see something. So I was riding her at the time, and uh, I saw a freighter taken right, right in front of us, uh, a bulk freighter, uh, the Malaspina Castle. Uh, uh, the pirates came alongside and boarded, and we had a Greek frigate right on our starboard beam. And she, I could see her put on another boiler and trying to fire up and get up there, but it, it was over in 15 minutes. So it's a very, very quick operation when these guys uh, come alongside, they get a ladder up, and they scamper up the side of the ship, and they get into the pilot house, and they take control right away. And once they've taken control, that's it. You know, there's just not, not much you can do about it, because uh, a rescue operation can be a very, very dangerous operation. And uh, uh, the, the model has been for these pirates has been a little bit different in that they only care about the crew. They don't care about the ship. They want to get the crew and ransom the crew. And so it has typically not been a good idea to attempt a rescue operation because uh, you're endangering the hostages more than, more than they uh, need to be. So uh, I was riding uh, Marsh, Georgia when I got the word that uh, Marsh, Alabama had been taken. And uh, uh, so I quickly uh, made arrangements and got off in uh, Suez and uh, made my way down to Mombasa, Kenya to head up our crisis team, which we, we sent in six people down there and fell in on top of the Marist Kenya operation that was already there uh, to uh, try to manage both the press interests in the region and also for me to deal more closely with the Navy that was starting to respond to the, to the incident. Uh, so when I talk about liners and feeders, this is what I'm talking about. 
uh, liner operations, uh, you can say, you know, Wednesday they're going to be here, uh, a week later they'll be here, a week later here, and, and that way people can plan their inventories on board these ships. That's what just-in-time shipping is all about, and people can therefore maintain lower inventory. Whereas feeders like uh, uh, Arkansas, I talked about, and Alabama, uh, we're operating uh, uh, just a feeder service from a large transshipment point like Salala, where they basically, ships come by and pile up containers in Salala, and then smaller ships take and distribute the containers into the region. And again, Alabama was involved in, in uh, distributing food aid. So on, on the morning of 8 uh, April 2009, uh, 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 the ship was approached by a skiff uh, full of Somali pirates. They had been approached the morning before. Uh, there had been three of them chasing uh, Alabama. Uh, two of them peeled off and one of them kept going and started to gain on, on Alabama. But it was Sea State 3 at the time, which is a chop on the water, and uh, the, the uh, pirate skiff could not keep up through the chop. So the next day, though, you can see, the, this is an actual picture from Alabama of the pirates as they were coming alongside. Uh, you can see the water is just like glass. So up until that point, no ship that could make at least 15 knots or had eight meters of freeboard uh, had ever been taken, and Alabama could make 18 knots, so we figured, you know, she, she could make enough speed to get away. And she had gotten away uh, previously, but this time, uh, because of the glass conditions, the, sh the uh, skiff was able to come up alongside, match the speed of the ship, throw a ladder up. Uh, the crew had activated fire hoses and everything else, and had done uh, all their normal actions, but uh, the pirates were able to get on board. Uh, there, there are ladders that go up the side of the deck house that had been raised and chained up uh, by the crew, but the pirates shot out the chains and dropped the ladders and then got up uh, to the pilot house where they uh, took the, the uh, master, the captain, and the third mate and an able-bodied seaman uh, captive. Meanwhile, the rest of the crew had all gathered down into a safe room which was the after steering compartment of the ship, where they uh, locked themselves in. They had supplies down there, and they took control of the ship from after steering, which you can do. You can take manual control down there. And they secured all the power in the, in the ship, which totally freaked out the pirates. They didn't know what to do. They had no idea how to, how to get the power back. They kept screaming at the captain to get the power back on. And, the captain kept saying, hey, I don't know where these guys are. I don't know what they can do. So uh, the pirates, uh, one of the pirates then took it upon himself. He was the leader. He was the guy that's just recently been convicted. But he went down to try to find the crew. And uh, uh, well, actually, one of the crew members came up to get him and took him down below to negotiate and actually told him to leave his weapon or else they wouldn't negotiate with him. So he left his weapon went down there and the crew captured him. And then they tried to arrange a, uh, a, a trade-off between uh, uh, the captain, uh, the third mate and the able-bodied seaman were able to, to get away, uh, were, were let go. And they took the captain and got in the lifeboat. And there was supposed to be a transfer there uh, between the, the, the crew and the pirates. Uh, but somehow that got fumbled and the, and the uh, the pirates ended up with the captain uh, in the lifeboat. And the rest, uh, most of you are probably familiar with the story, but they spent several days in the, in the lifeboat. Uh, the engine crapped out. They were bobbing around. It was very hot. Uh, the pirates were very, very uncomfortable. They were seasick. Uh, and the Bainbridge was on station at that time uh, with the boxer there in the background. And they managed to talk the uh, pirates into allowing the, the ship to hook a line up to them, and they told them, well, we'll tow you to Somalia, which was pretty funny, but, because uh, they actually took them out further to sea, of course. And uh, every hour, they would just take another little turn on the, on the line and bring it in closer and closer and closer. And uh, they would do things like increase the speed of the ship and get it rocking, get the lifeboat moving up and down. And there became a point 
And of course, the SEALs arrived at, one night. They flew in, and uh, uh, there were three uh, snipers on the fantail there, uh, zeroed in on the pirates. And uh, uh, they got the lifeboat skipping around a good bit, got the pirates agitated. The pirates started firing the weapons at, at the ship, which according to the rules of engagement, once the pirates started shooting at the ship, the ship was had you know, batteries released to go ahead and, and take out the pirates, which they did in, in three instantaneous shots all at once, took out all three pirates. So uh, that, that tells you something about the capability that we have in the Navy SEALs. Uh, they're a pretty incredible group of people. And it was just another day for them. And uh, they completed that operation, packed their bags, and said, OK, we're ready to leave. And, uh, and uh, luckily, it was a, a happy ending for, for Captain Phillips. He, he was taken aboard the Bainbridge for uh, three or four days of uh, rest and relaxation on a good Navy ship. And then uh, he was brought uh, back into uh, Mombasa, where I uh, met up with him. and. Uh, rode home with him on uh, our blue corporate jet, the Yetamersk, which uh, was the best 17-hour flight I've ever taken, uh, direct from Mombasa to Burlington, Vermont, his home, which was, uh, which was a fun, fun time. Uh, like I said, I was with the, with the crew. The crew was very proud uh, that they, they really never lost control of the ship. Uh, so they, they will take offense if you say the ship was successfully hijacked. It was not hijacked. Uh, they, they, uh, because of their actions, they were able to, to stop that. Uh, we put them up in a nice hotel there in Mombasa, got in a new crew, got the cargo offloaded, and uh, dealt with the press. And uh, that's a typical picture of me with a finger in one ear and trying to hear my cell phone uh, down there. Uh, but uh, that, that all really worked out, uh, worked out well for us. Uh, some of the lessons learned from the event, uh, uh, it was very important that we had a strong leader in Captain Phillips. He was a, a great captain, a good master, uh, uh, and uh, he foresaw that there may be this type of incident, and he had a plan, he had a very detailed plan, and he, he trained the crew routinely at it. And the crew used to grouse about it a bit because he trained them an awful lot at it, and that's how he that's how he was. He was a bit of a bit of a hard ass, and uh, but he did the job and, and did it well. We also had strong leadership uh, uh, in the U.S. Our CEO there, John Reinhardt, uh, operating a, a centralized command cell where everybody knew where we were, where to go talk to us. The press, we had one theme, one message. We communicated a clear message to uh, the families, which was very, very important. Obviously, you can imagine the families were, were very concerned during this time, and uh, also having one central message for the press. Uh, as I said, we invest a certain amount of time and effort in strong relationships with the government. Uh, we participated uh, up front in what's called uh, the Maritime uh, Operational Threat Response which is uh, when an incident at sea happens, uh, all the interagency comes together on the phone. And uh, they actually opened it up and allowed us to come in uh, to uh, discuss the whole problem and what we're going to do about it. Uh, some of the issues to consider about piracy. Uh, like I said, it's a very diverse industry. There's a lot of different players. You have everything from mom and pop operations with one or two ships all the way up to these global shipping conglomerates. Uh, so there's a lot of difference. I'm frankly a little embarrassed by how some of the ships and some of the people in our industry have responded to this problem. That we still have people sailing through that area and acting like nothing's happening at all. They don't even know that there's piracy in the area, which is kind of incredible. You have to be living under a rock not to know that. But uh, that's been a bit of an issue of, of concern. Uh, there, we, as I said, there was a difference in uh, awareness of uh, some of the US flag shipping that was carrying Department of State cargo. The Department of Defense had no idea of it. They, they didn't even know that it was happening. So there wasn't great communication between the Department of Defense and the Department of State. 
in some of, this, uh, some of these issues. Uh, I talked about the motor uh, process. It worked very well when we were a part of it, but we eventually got cut out after the first or second motor call. Uh, the government kind of withdrew to themselves in dealing with this. We, didn't, we weren't sure we, our views were really uh, getting across to them. So we would, we would recommend open, opening up the motor process uh, uh, for private industry to participate all the way through the process. There's been a lot of talk about armed security. Why don't ships have armed security? Uh, people say, well, gee whiz, you know, every warehouse has uh, somebody armed. But it, it's not quite as easy out there on the high seas. It's a very difficult environment. Uh, there are issues with liability. There's issues with command and control, with rules of engagement, who's in charge of these people, who vets these people, these armed security companies. Uh, they're not licensed by any one uh, person, one, one government. So uh, uh, it's many uh, countries, many flag states, are very tentative about this or don't want it at all. Uh, my parent uh, company, a uh, good Danish company, does not want armed security on board their ships. Uh, they, they'll only do it if, if the flag state tells them to do it. Uh, and there's differences in culture. You know, uh, Americans are more comfortable with firearms. We have a Second Amendment. Many of us have grown up around them. Uh, there's many countries that's not the case at all. If you have a weapon, you're going to get arrested. And so uh, uh, there, there are differences there. Uh, many people will think, well, if you just stop paying ransoms, this problem would go away. Well, yeah, maybe. But if you were on that ship and you were taken, is that what you would want? I'm not so sure. I'm not so sure we would be able to get people to go to sea for us if they thought that we wouldn't pay to get them, get them home as quickly as possible. So I mean, we're very, very concerned about the safety of our people. And you know, uh, it's a little simplistic to say just stop paying ransoms. I mean, and there, you, you've got to think about many different types. It's not uncommon to have, say, a ship that's owned by a South African company chartered to a Greek company uh, that's operated by a completely another co a company that will be operating under a Panamanian flag and have Indian officers and a Filipino crew. Uh, so who's going to rescue them? Uh, nobody's going to rescue them, and, and they know it. So, so just to say stop paying ransoms uh, is, is a little bit too simplistic. Uh, obviously, with the, the conditions ashore in Somalia, that's the root cause of, of what's happening here. It's an ungoverned space, uh, very weak governance uh, at best in some, some isolated parts. Uh, until we really solve that, uh, it's just going to continue to fester and to, uh, continue to get worse. Um, and really, when we think about how to deal with that, uh, no one country can solve it. The United States certainly has no appetite to go in there on their own, I don't think. And I don't, uh, I don't think any nation does. So it's going to have to be a concerted, uh, multilateral approach using all you know, diplomatic information, military, economic tools that we have. Uh, uh, access to. Uh, but just to keep the whole problem, when we talk about this in perspective, we have to remember that it, it's a terrible thing, and, and we are very, very concerned about the safety of our mariners. We don't, even on those big, fast ships that we have, we don't like the fact that they go through there and people are shooting at them. Because uh, you can be on a big, fast, safe ship, but if somebody's firing a rocket-propelled grenade at you, uh, it's still you know, a pretty hairy situation, so, so that's a, an issue of concern. But when people talk uh, about this, there is some hyperbole that goes on, that there's, there's a threat to the global economic system. Uh, it's, not, it's not really the case right now. Uh, through that area, through the Gulf of Aden, 22,000 transits a year. Uh, 2,000 of those are just from us, from AP Mortal and Maersk. Uh, uh, there's about 250, uh, my company, my American flag company, uh, has about 250 transits a year through there. And so when you count up the number of, uh, of attacks uh, that we've gotten up to uh, uh, several hundred uh, uh, attacks a year, uh, it's really in the, sc in the scope of the global shipping game and 90% of our goods traveling on, on the seas 
it's not really impacting the global economy. Uh, but it is, it is definitely a threat to that region. It's a threat to countries like Kenya. They've suffered uh, from this. Uh, Tanzania, Madagascar, uh, small little countries like the Seychelles that depend on tourism so, so much. Uh, it's, it's definitely had an impact on them. Uh, you'll also hear a lot about insurance rates. Uh, insurance rates are going sky high. Insurance rates are affecting uh, companies. Uh, that depends on the scale of the company, to tell you the truth. Uh, for that mom and pop company that only operates a couple of little steamers, yeah, that's a big deal. But for a big global shipping company like us, we team together with other big global shipping companies in what are called P&I clubs uh, that, that we drive down the rates because of the power of the market. And uh, we don't accept it if rates get too high. Uh, and if, it do, if they do get too high, then we'll just walk away and self-insure. So, so I think a little bit more has been made of the insurance part of this than, uh, than really uh, uh, matters, to tell you the truth. Insurance doesn't drive whether a company is going to go through this area or not. It, they're more affected by uh, economic cyclical conditions uh, like we had in 2008. The high price of oil can definitely have an effect on where you go. Suez Canal rates, actually, uh, to charge $450,000 to transit the Suez Canal, that, that has more of, a, more of an impact than, than the piracy in the region, to tell you the truth. But, but again, I'm not trying to make light of it. It's, it's something we really don't like and we really uh, would like to see, see solved. And frankly, uh, as a former naval officer, I feel it myself that it's kind of embarrassing to the world's navies that they can't seem to get a handle on this. And uh, the US Navy recently came out with a maritime strategy called the Cooperative Strategy for 21st Century Sea Power. And they embraced maritime security in the global commons as something that was their responsibility. But they also said that it's not just the responsibility of any one nation, that, that all the nations that operate navies have to work together uh, to, to maintain the safety and security of these areas. And definitely the regional uh, navies in the area, navies like Saudi Arabia, Egypt, uh, Kenya, they have to participate in this process as, as well to maintain that security. Some of the recent trends that we've seen that are, are kind of disturbing, this use of motherships is becoming uh, more and more uh, frequent. This uh, one that I'm showing here in the upper right-hand corner is what was commonly called a mothership. It's a, a bigger uh, skiff, really, just loaded down with drums of uh, fuel. Uh, now they've gotten a little bit more sophisticated. They're, they're taking uh, fishing vessels or even larger uh, uh, ships, up to you know, two, 300 ton ships, and, and operating with more and more pirates aboard these, these things and uh, sailing further and further out to the point that they're ranging out as far as all the way to the coast of India and all the way down south to Madagascar. They're covering basically the whole northern uh, Indian Ocean at this time. And to give you a frame of reference, whereas before they were operating in the Gulf of Aden mainly and, and the uh, upper Somali Basin, which was an area about the size of Texas, no, which is pretty big <laughs> anyway. But now we're talking about a, a, an area the size of the continental United States. So. You take 36 warships out there at the most. I think we've had 36. We're probably in the high 20s now. Uh, for them to patrol an area that big is, is virtually impossible. It's very, very difficult. There, there seem to be more and more criminal elements involved as it becomes more and more lucrative. Uh, piracy was thought to, uh, in this region, was thought to begin mainly with probably fishermen in the areas that had been overfished. And, and they needed some way to make a living, so they started into this. That's a theory. Uh, but there's always been some bad elements, but it, there seem to be more and more uh, uh, violent criminal elements. And they started to draw uh, people from the hinterlands in Somalia are gathering into these uh, pirate bands. There's about 50 known pirate bands and about two to 3,000 pirates, we think. They operate out of six known pirate bases on the coast of Somalia. We know exactly where they come from. Uh, they're, uh, 
they, a lot of them chew this cot, which is a drug, uh, kind of hypes them up. It's a, a stimulant, and uh, sometimes it can lead to some erratic behavior uh, by some of them. And they're using younger and younger kids. It's one of these symptoms of Africa, the, the children soldiers. Uh, the Indians picked up a ship uh, last week that had 80 pirates on board, which is a lot more than <laughs> What was typically seen, typically we see four or five in a skiff in a small uh, boat, but you know, we've got 80 of them on a mothership. Uh, I think almost 60 of them were under the age of 15. So now you're getting into a much more complex problem. The Indians didn't know what to do because they have, they have very robust uh, child uh, prosecution. Uh, I mean, not robust, but, but they take very seriously somebody's underage and they have to go to juvenile court, and, you know, it's a democracy and they're not, they're not just going to start killing these uh, young, youngsters. So it adds a whole other layer of complexity. And, and they're not very sophisticated and uh, if they get pushed a little bit too much, they may act e even more erratically uh, than an adult would. And I've talked to you already about how difficult this is to contain. Uh, I'm going to go through some ideas that I have uh, that, that might help in the process. Some of them are my own ideas. Some are ideas I've borrowed from other folks. Uh, uh, a lot of it's not rocket science, science but uh, uh, we'll go through each of them. I kind of divide it into short, mid-range, and longer-range solutions. I think in the short range, we, we definitely need to focus on containing this uh, this piracy. It is spreading, it is becoming more violent, uh, it's becoming a, r a real concern for, for the safety of our mariners. So uh, I do believe we need to increase maritime power in the region, but it's got to be the right kind of forces properly applied. You can't just go out there in large capital warships and start shooting it up. Uh, there's thousands of, if you go out there, there's thousands of these small boats out there. They're all over the place. Some of them are fishermen, some of them are trading back and forth within the, the islands out there and along the coast. Uh, some of them are smugglers, some of them are pirates. And sometimes they switch between all those uh, different uh, things. So it's very hard to sort out who is who out there. And it's not just a matter of if some boat is approaching you, you start shooting at them. Uh, because it may be a legitimate uh, fisherman or somebody that just happens to be on an intercept course with you. There are things that you can do to try to hail him and make, find out what his intentions are. Uh, so I, I would call for more surveillance assets like this uh, maritime patrol aircraft, a P-3. We need more, more of those types of aircraft out there. Uh, there's a, I think there's a role for unmanned aerial uh, uh, vehicles, uh, UAVs, uh, both armed and unarmed. Uh, I, I think there's a role for, for airships even. Yeah, an airship uh, is a nice, long, uh, persistent platform that can stay out there for a long time. And if it has the right radars and communications equipment and things, it can, it can provide some long-term uh, surveillance. Uh, I've been talking about an idea called uh, irregular sea control, and this deals with persistent sea basing. I think there, there's a role for that. We know the six ports that they're operating out. So rather than waiting for them to all get underway and come out into the big blue ocean where they're almost impossible to find, I think it would be better to apply some uh, concentrated maritime power uh, on these ports. Uh, not, not necessarily a strict blockade where we don't allow anything out, but something where we operate, and you could operate commercial vessels or, or barges or very low-end type stuff. This is a low-end problem. It's not a high-end problem. Uh, and lots of small boats, you know, whether they be uh, Coast Guard, sailors, uh, whatever. Uh, and they're making an international effort, too, uh, to get in and amongst these people to sort out who the good guys are from the bad guys. Because it's very similar to uh, being doing a, a regular warfare ashore, I think. Uh, think about Afghanistan. If we just rolled around in Afghanistan in M1 tanks and didn't talk to anybody, uh, we'd have a pretty hard time. Well, that's essentially what we're doing in this environment. We're steaming around in large capital warships that we, we can't really converse or talk to the people or figure out what's going on. And uh, I think that that's really something that needs to be looked at. 
Uh, definitely, there's a role for commercial industry. Uh, we have a responsibility to harden our vessels, uh, to, to follow what are called BMPs, the best management practices that have been put together by uh, uh, Intertanko and BIMCO, which are two uh, big maritime associations. They've been blessed by the uh, International Maritime Organization, IMO. Uh, these are basic measures that we can take aboard our ships, and we all need to do that. We have a responsibility to do that. We know that. And in some cases, in order to provide a service to a, a certain port, we may have to consider arming it, arming the ship. And uh, we've done that with, with Maersk, Alabama, uh, as the pirates who tried to take her a couple weeks ago found out that, that that's the wrong ship to be attacking these days, because uh, uh, we have some very high-end security on board. So uh, that's, that's very important. And you can see there's an example of uh, razor wire and stuff that we can string around the side of it. You can have hot steam piping or, or fire hoses or all sorts of type things. There's uh, non-lethal measures that can be taken. Things like uh, long-range acoustic devices, it's called an LRAD. It's a very focused, uh, high-volume hailer that will literally break your eardrums uh, if you get too close to it. And that's a, that's a, those types of things uh, are useful. And uh, lately, the Department of Treasury has been getting very involved in, in following the money. You know, there's, there's 14, I think, 14 known big, we, big wheel investors in Somalia that they know about, and they're trying to track the money back to, to other international people that are involved in, in investing in this. But I, I would caveat that, though, that uh, investing in piracy is something that is happening at even the lowest levels of Somali society. People are investing in, in these pirate gangs. They, they give them a certain amount of money or they give them weaponry and they get a return on it. Uh, and they have their own little stock market going on uh, in this uh, uh, also. So I think following the money is a part of the problem, but it's, it's not going to be the only solution. When we talk about broader midterm solutions, I think uh, it would be very useful to have one centralized sort of uh, command and control node in the region, whether it's in Djibouti or Salala or Aden or someplace like that, because it's very difficult from the commercial side. You have to go in, when you go into this area, you have to report to three or four different people. You report to what's called the Maritime Security Center of Horn of Africa, and they're actually located in Northwood, England. And you have to, when you enter into the uh, internationally recognized transit scheme there, you have to report to them, and then you have to report every hour to an organization called UKMTO, which is the UK's Maritime Transportation Office. And then you have other people like Marlow, which is the Maritime Liaison Officer in Bahrain, uh, the U.S. Fifth Fleet, uh, the uh, uh, CTF-151, EU NAV-4, the NATO forces. <laughs> they're all out there operating together. It's a wonderful thing that they're all out there operating together. Uh, but it's a lot of different people for the commercial industry to, to, to have to interface with. Uh, there are things that have to be done on the legal side. Uh, there is international law, custom and law for, for piracy, but every nation needs to have their own domestic laws to deal with this. We've had cases where people have uh, gotten a hold of the pirates and then they, they can't take them home to their country to try them because there's no laws on the books. For, for piracy. So uh, every country needs to, uh, to look at that. And uh, uh, there definitely needs to be uh, some sort of consistent uh, national approach. Uh, we've seen instances where one country's navy will, will do one thing with one set of pirates and a different one with, the, with another set of pirates. So you, you're trying to figure out what their, what their guidance is and what their rules are. Uh, but we definitely need to keep talking about that. Uh, I talk about a thing called Maritime Security Consortiums. This is a, a, an idea that I have for public-private partnerships, uh, companies to partner with maritime security forces to try to share awareness in the, in the area. Uh, there's a lot that could be done. There's, we have a lot of information on things that we see, and, and we could provide that to, to navies if we had a a common place to go to to provide that information. Uh, 
We have our own, uh, there's a system called the automated information system, which is sort of a beacon that every ship flashes that says, hey, I'm the Maersk Georgia, I'm headed from Salala to Djibouti, uh, I'm carrying this cargo, da da da. Uh, if you take, and it, it gives very precise in, uh, locating information, if you take that and correlate that with your own onboard radar, and we've done some experiments with this, uh, and then put it into a data services network and beam it to an operations center or somebody that could, could see what we're seeing, that would help, help them to uh, maintain some awareness. So long-term solutions, uh, as I've said, and anybody that knows anything about the topic, the, the, the solution is ashore. Uh, the, the things that we can do to contain piracy at sea are, are really only going to be short or midterm at best, and that eventually something's got to be done in Somalia. Now, it's not something that's very attractive to most countries. And, and any of you that have seen Black Hawk Down or, or are familiar with our operations in Mogadishu, uh, you know that uh, it's not a very attractive thing to the United States. And I wouldn't say that the United States should be the only player in something like this. It, it's something that it is going to eventually require a, a, a multilateral approach and as much as possible uh, using the countries in the region to deal with it. And uh, uh, there's got to be a basis there for, for some sort of economic development to get these people to find an alternative way of uh, finding a li living rather than, uh, than piracy. Uh, I, as I've said with my ideas about sea basing, I think that's also not about just building awareness in the area, but there should be a training mission along with that, uh, working uh, with these, these sort of sub-regional governments like Puntland and S Somaliland to try to build up their own indigenous uh, law enforcement capability and capacity there to, to police their own waters. And I think we have to relook our policy. The United States policy is just, just to deal with the TFG, which is the transitional federal government that controls a few blocks of, Mo of Mogadishu. Uh, we're going to have to, I think, deal with more uh, uh, entities like, like Somaliland and Puntland and try to build up their own. And there's lots of issues there. I, I recognize it's not easy. Uh, there's uh, rule of law issues. There's corruption uh, uh, that we're going to have to we're going to have to fight through. Uh, but it's it's going to be a long term problem, and there, there's no, no short term easy solutions. I've heard a lot from a lot of uh, people. Oh, why don't we just do convoys? Well, convoys work in certain areas. We we have a, sort of a convoy system there in the Gulf of Aden. It has actually lowered the attacks in the Gulf of Aden, but it's. It's not something that's practicable uh, out in the larger Indian Ocean, obviously. It would take uh, thousands and thousands of naval vessels to, to operate a real convoy out there. So just in conclusion, uh, we, we recognize that this is a difficult problem. Uh, we know that there's no quick, uh, quick solutions, uh, but there are some short-term short things that we think could be done to. Uh, to contain it a little bit more. And we're, we're definitely willing to do our part. We think any solution needs to embrace the commercial maritime industry also as a, as a partner in, in, in the solution. Uh, but you know, we, we operate out, out there in, in these very hazardous waters. We provide a service to our customers uh, at great risk sometimes to our mariners. And uh, we, we recognize that it's not an easy problem. And we very, very much appreciate what, what the United States Navy has done and what, what the other navies have done. I mean, you've got navies from Korea, Malaysia, Singapore, India out there, uh, all operating together. And as I've said, it's the first time that uh, you've had a, a, all the members of the UN Security Council actually operating together in a, in a military operation, including the Chinese. So it's, it's pretty amazing. Uh, but we'd like to continue to be a part of the dialogue and, and help where we can. So that concludes my uh, talk, and uh, I'm open to take any questions.
mentioned earlier that a ship was armed and I, that uh, the Somalians didn't realize who they were messing with. What, whatever happened on that attack? Uh, this, uh, the, I, I, I assume you I was talking about uh, Maersk, Alabama, the more recent one, a, a couple weeks ago. Uh, this uh, skiff full of four pirates, uh, what we assess to be pirates, actually, when you can see a ladder on board, then you have a pretty good idea that they're up to no good. And a uh, rocket propelled grenade, they're, they're uh, lifting up. Uh, they uh, they uh, were seen from a distance, the, uh, the ship tried to evade, she uh, tried to take several different course changes, and the, and the skiff continued to change course to follow her to try to intercept, so it was obvious that they were, they were coming in closer. Uh, and then uh, we have a security team on board, uh, uh, four guys, uh, and they uh, uh, have a very set procedure at set ranges that they, that they warn the, uh, the guys coming in, they usually use a long-range acoustic device to, to, to hit them with that, those loud sound bursts. They continue to come on, they fire warning shots, they continue to come, uh, then they took them under fire. And uh, they're not sure uh, if they hit anybody or, or not, but uh, there was plenty of ample opportunity for the, for the skiff to turn away, but they didn't. Yeah, the four Americans uh, that were killed on this uh, yacht, the Quest. Terrible, terrible uh, incident. Uh, what it appears, uh, you know, I'm not, I'm, I don't have any inside information on it, to tell you the truth. I saw what, what you've seen in the press, and, you know, it appears that uh, there was some very aggressive negotiating going on. They had sent a couple of pirates uh, on board the Navy ship. Uh, that were being held. Uh, the negotiators said, uh, these guys aren't cutting it, they're not negotiating with us, we need two more. Uh, some sort of altercation was going on on board the yacht between the pirates. There may have been, they're, they're not sure, there may have been two factions involved or whatnot, but it appears that there was a loss of control and somebody started shooting and shot the, the hostages and there was a a firefight between the pirates where a couple of pirates were killed. There was a, it, w it was not a rescue operation as I understand it. Uh, there w was a boatload of SEALs investigating because they had heard the shots and there had actually been an RPG fired at, at the Navy ship. So they were coming in to, to try to assess what was going on. And when they heard all the shooting, they went in and, and tried to stop it, but it was already out of control. And this, I think, is indicative of some of the, the younger, kids involved in this and maybe hopped up even more on, on the cot or whatever, nervous and afraid because the, their leaders had been taken uh, and then the interfactional sort of thing. So other than that, I'm not really uh, familiar with exactly what happened. Um, <clears throat> Eric Chris and uh, Blackwater, a uh, number of months ago were um, uh, supposedly getting involved with, in uh, possibly providing security in the region. And whatever happened with that? Uh, uh, kind of died a quiet death, at least as far as press coverage. Yeah, uh, they invested in a, uh, a, a small vessel, uh, and their business model was to, uh, you know, charter their services out uh, to private industry. Uh, they changed their name from Blackwater to Z, which is Z-E, and uh, they did not get a contract. There was nobody that was interested uh, because of, of the, the liability issues and the control issues. It's even more difficult if you have a, another ship out there, another boat, and how are they going to interact with the naval forces out there? It's just enter, it, another whole level of complexity that most companies I don't think we're interested in. And so they proceeded out to the region, and I think they got out to Israel, and I don't think they got much further than that. Uh, the vessel that they had chosen was a former NOAA vessel that was rather slow, 
And uh, I don't think it would have been an appropriate platform anyway, but uh, they, I think they were operating a small helicopter off it. But uh, basically, I think they ran out of money and they didn't have any contracts, so uh, it kind of died a quiet death, as you said. What's the fate of the 13 or 14 pirates that shot the four Americans? Where they are now and where they uh, are now? I, I, I'm not familiar. I know they were brought back to the United States. I, I think they were arraigned, and uh, I think they're getting ready for trial. That's about all I know about it. Um, and we have, as I said, in this country, we have very, very robust piracy laws, and so I don't think it'll be an issue convicting them. Oh, go ahead. Hi, uh, thank you for coming to speak before us. Um, our professor always um, instructs us to kind of think more broadly, and so I'm doing just that, Professor David. And um, I, this is just a philosophical question, um, and this is in reference to the um, 93 um, humanitarian effort that the U.S. was involved in. And basically, uh, would it be fair to infer that the lawlessness of colonialism and more recently globalism, as seen from the eyes of uh, indigenous citizens, um, would that would it be fair to uh, lend some kind of um, support for the philosophical justification for piracy? You know, taking into consideration that um, that humanitarian effort could have grown into economic development and you know, full-scale trade initiatives, you know, from that particular effort. Yeah, I, you know, personally, I, it's hard for me to justify anything like this. It's, it's horrendous. Uh, and, and I acknowledge the, you know, the past that Somalia has had, uh, you know, the, the colonialism and, and, and those types of influences. Uh, there's some pretty good evidence that there was overfishing in the, in the area by uh, certain countries with large factory ships that came in and cleaned them out pretty, pretty well. Uh, but, you know, uh, it's, it's more complex than that. Uh, you have a lot of these tribal inter-clan type issues that are endemic in all of Africa, not all of Africa, but certain regions in Africa suffer from this. It seems to be particularly bad in Somalia. They have a hard time organizing government. Uh, uh, the reason why they do, I, I, I'm, not, I'm not a complete expert on, on the history of Somalia, but uh, for whatever reason, they've had a, a lot of difficulty there. They've had civil wars, insurgencies, and a lot of internecine conflict between the clans that have made it very, very difficult for them to organize any kind of real governance. It, it's, it's not completely wild there, though, you know. Uh, Puntland is organizing, Somaliland is organizing. They have an incredible, they have an incredible cell phone network there. Everybody's got a cell phone. Uh, the, there still is trade that goes in there. There's large car carriers that go in there and bring automobiles. All these uh, pirate kingpins are driving around in big Mercedes and, and uh, SUVs and, uh, so it, it's, 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 it's interesting uh, why Somalia is the way it is, uh, but I don't think we can really condone it. We have to act upon it. Uh, there is a rule of, we want to have some sort of governance and rule of law so that we can trade uh, safely. Okay. to ask two questions. One of them is, in your slide, you show that there are several hundreds of um, people still hostage in yeah. Somalia. Mm -hmm. And I think I read that in the newspaper. Yeah. And thank you. second, are these eight posts or eight ports where the um, pirates come out, are they organized? Is this one big company, or each one operates separate? Yeah, it's, uh, it's kind of unclear. Each of, it appears that each of the ports has their own uh, set gang, or maybe a couple of gangs that are operating there. Uh, it is sort of a uh, 
appears to be an organized crime type of thing, uh, where you have local sort of kingpins that are that are running the operation, and they have a certain sway over the community. They pay off certain elements of the community. When they when they go out, they have certain guys that appear to be the ocean-going guys, uh, pirates that usually have a few people with them that have some sort of experience at sea that can navigate and get them where they need to go. And then they, they bring the vessel back to these ports and they, uh, they have a whole set system where they hire the local population to come on board the ship and to watch over the hostages so that everybody's getting a cut of the pie. Uh, uh, it can be, uh, I've read that each pirate really only gets like $10,000 out of these multi-million dollar ransoms, they, uh, a large chunk goes to whoever's financing the whole uh, operation and then uh, it gets distributed out amongst uh, in a patronage sort of system. Uh, but uh, it's kind of unclear, you know. Uh, we we uh, have talked to some uh, commercial intelligence people that uh, actually go on the ground in there and kind of have some idea of what's going on, but it's pretty unclear. It's not a place that people want to go to and uh, find out the true story all the time. Okay, well, yes? Piracy is a worldwide problem. Do you have any idea what percentage of the piracy is happening in Somalia versus the rest of the world? Yeah, uh, the attacks that are happening now, and, and if you, uh, the, the, the best source to go to is the International uh, Maritime Bureau, the IMB. They operate a thing called the PRC, the Piracy Reporting Center. It's out of Kuala Lumpur in uh, Malaysia. They keep all the statistics on maritime crime. And uh, right now, it's about two-thirds of the attacks in 2011 have happened off Somalia or originate from gangs that are, that are operating out of the Horn of Africa in Somalia. Uh, that's up from, from last year. The year before, I think it was about 50%, and they're up to about two-thirds now. Are there any pirates operating from Eritrea? Uh, Eritrea? Uh, yeah, I don't, uh, I don't believe that. I've never read anything about Eritrea. Um, the mo most everything I've seen, it's been Somalis, some Yemenis uh, involved, because uh, there is a good bit of traffic going between Somalia and Yemen. And, uh, there's quite an active smuggling, smuggling trade that goes uh, between those countries in arms and a number of things. Yeah, um, what accounts for the hostages that are still continuing to be held? Is that just a matter of time? Is it some companies aren't willing to pay ransom or? Yeah, or? yeah. Uh, and again, some of these companies are kind of shadowy. You know, you don't even know. Uh, the maritime industry is divided up into, you'll have a, you have a top tier that are the big, you know, I think we're in the top tier, obviously. Uh, AP Moeller, Merrick, the large conglomerate. Uh, folks like Exxon, Shell, you know, big, big companies that operated at tier one and they, they run their ships for 20, 25 years and then they sell them to a, sort of a mid-tier group of players that, are, uh, that operate the ships for another 10 or 15 years until they've expended every bit of life out of them. And then there's a the lowest tier of people that are in all sorts of nefarious activities. And uh, so uh, it, it's hard to say. Uh, uh, the top companies, if they're involved, we had a tug that was taken A.P. Moeller had a tug, uh, Spitzer, a company that they, one of their companies, was taken in uh, 2008, and uh, it took 47 days to get them uh, freed. And that was uh, using some really good uh, local 
folks that knew how to negotiate with these people. It was a very slow, time-consuming process, just getting to talk to the right people to, and then getting them. And, and they hold out. They're, you know, they, they keep upping it. You know, if you say you'll pay this, and all of a sudden they'll raise it and raise it again. And then, so you know, it, it, it's, some of it is some slowness on, on the side, uh, a question of who, e who is even going to pay. Uh, is it going to be the owner, the operating company, the chartering company, the, you know, the <laughs> a lot of different people involved. Um, but, uh, you know, it's like anything, uh, it's a business and, and they, will, they will squeeze out every last dollar they can get on it. Thank you very much. I have a copy of the biography of George Washington ah, great. by Richard Norton Smith, the noted American historian, but also known to us as the former director of our Gerald R. Ford Museum. So I hope you enjoy that. And we also right. have one of our new shiny World Affairs Council mugs. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> and we'll ship this one to you. Yeah, okay. Thank great. you very much Thank for you. a very enlightening talk. Yeah, appreciate it. for our last uh, lecture of the season with Dr. Susan Davis coming out of Russia's shadow of the Caucasus countries. We are adjourned.